Okay, so to find Tuca, mine is in my little um, Windows menu on the bottom left. If yours isn't showing up as a shortcut here, just go into All Programs. The one that we're going to use is Tuca Design. So there's a ton of Tuca products. Um, I talked about a couple of them. So the Tuca Design is the basic 2D flat pattern making program. Um, that's the program that you're going to be renting. Um, they obviously have 3D rendering and all sorts of other craziness, but the, the basic, the kind of foundation program is the Tuca Design. Okay, um, Tuca Design can do some marker making, can do some grading, but they have specialized, crazy, robust marker making ones that you use the same files back and forth. Okay, so when I open up Tuca Design, It's going to look like this. And if you opened it up at home, if you downloaded it, it's free to download. You just can't do anything with it if you don't have a key. We have an internal key here within our network over in the other building. And again, if that network goes down, poof, everybody will say, can't find your key. Um, so please bring your key every week once you have it, just in case um, and when that happens. Um, so unlike Illustrator, Tuca Design has all of their tools visible on the top. There aren't any hidden tools hiding underneath tools, um, which can be good and can be bad. Um, it makes for a much more cluttered workspace, I think. Um, and But it's also easier to find what you need once you kind of reasonably understand where they are. This is one of the reasons because it can look quite overwhelming when you see all 50 whatever of them all at once. That's why I want you to have your little um, handbook handy for when you can't remember what that whatever tool looks like. Okay, <clears throat> So all of your tools are at the top. We do have menus at the top, kind of like what you're used to in every other program. Um, so there is the file menu where you can open up a new file or open or whatever. Um, the kicker is, and this gets a little weird, the once you sign up for the program and once you download it and once you've got your key you've got I want to say 30 hours to accomplish a certain task. <laughs> um, the key is specifically coded to your account at Tuca and it's such an expensive and proprietary program that they want to make sure the person who has the key on the computer you're using is really you. Okay, so they want to, um, and I'm sure you've done this kind of thing with other programs or with a bank account. They want to authenticate that it's really you and you're the one that's paying for the program and not using it to go make stuff for American Apparel. Or, you know, that doesn't make sense because they already have the program, but American Apparel's competitor. Okay, so you've got 30 hours of user time while we go through the process of authenticating the fact that you are really who you say you are and this is the computer that you plan on using. Okay, So um, let's say you've got a PC at home. They would prefer it if you choose a single computer to authenticate on so that that computer is the one that, that they will recognize the IP address for. Does that make sense? Um, that said, if there are times when you need two computers, um, for instance, this is the one I use at home, and I don't have the network key, which I think is stupid. <laughs> We're all in the same room. I have to use a key every single day. I'm, I'm not part of your network. Um, so I got permission to be authenticated on both computers. So if you can, try to keep it to one or two computers. <coughs> the way it works, um, and she can tell you more about this. This is what I really want them to tell you next week. So maybe remind me, or maybe one of you can ask how this works because I've done it, but it was years ago that I had to do it, so it's not fresh. Um, when you open the program, it will say something about an ask file. There's a file built in when you download the program. There's a file, you know, how whenever you um, install a program, it comes with other file folders of stuff. In one of those file folders of stuff, there's a little file called an ask file. You're going to email the ask file to Tukatech. And they will say, yes, you're who you say you are. And they will send you back and kind of an answer file. I don't know what they call it, but it's you, you send them the ask file. They send you this little answer file. You stick that file on your computer, and you're good to go. 
In the meantime, while you're waiting for email to go back and forth, because maybe you send your ask file on a Friday and they're not in until Monday, you still have 30 hours to work on your program without having to wait for them to answer and authenticate. Does that make sense? This is where it gets even weirder. If I have one window open for an hour and I'm working on my skirt file, that's going to count as one hour against my 30. I'm already authenticated, so I'm not worried about just leaving this on and open. Okay, But let's say I wanted to have my bodice file open and my skirt file open in different windows. They're going to count each one of those as an hour. So if I have both of them open for an hour, it's going to count them as two hours. Reason why I'm saying this for uh, most people, it's not a problem. But sometime in the middle of the semester, Everybody's going to start freaking out. It says I don't have any more time left. And you know, I'm going to tell you, you never bothered to send your ask file to them to authenticate. Okay? So that 30 hours is your time to get the email chain going. Okay? And, and a lot of students just don't bother or forget because they think, I don't know, 30 hours. I probably won't have more homework than that. I'm not going to bother. Well, guess what? If you have many files open, Three files open for one hour, that counts as three hours. Five files open for an hour, that counts as five hours. And some of you are the type of people who like to have a lot of stuff open. Okay, um, It's in Illustrator or Word or any other program, you can open lots of different files within, like if I went File, New, and this was, let's go back to Illustrator, what would happen if I did File, New? I'd get another file that I can open and have accessible within my same window. Okay, Illustrator is running once. In Tukatech, if I wanted to open another file, it's going to open up another session of Tukatech. It's not going to be sharing one window and one workspace. It's going to be running Tukatech twice. Are we clear on that? So when you go to open a new file, it's going to ask you, do you want to replace the one you're currently wo working on? As in, shut this one, open up another one. So you just have Tuka running once and you're only getting counted for one hour if you haven't authenticated. Or it's going to say, um, if you want to open up a new instance, it'll, it'll look like it's starting Tuka Tech up. And it's just Tuka Tech is open twice as if it's two different programs. So the, that's another major difference between programs you're used to using and what CAD programs do. Okay, so it's going to feel, I, I want to say it felt for me very clunky because I'm used to being very freeform with my computer use and this is very, very regimented and um, it's very, which is great for pattern making, but there's some things that I'm just like, why can't I just have several things open and randomly arrayed on my page? It doesn't work that way, okay? So you just get used to it and you might get frustrated in the beginning, but once you kind of learn their parameters, it'll start to make more sense, okay? So first thing we're going to do is build a rectangle. Any idea how? Look on your screen. Do you see anything that you think could help us build a rectangle? The actual button that says rectangle. How do I know it says rectangle? Hover above it. Okay. If you hover over any of these tools, it will tell you the name of the tool. Now they've tried to make the icons look like something that you might recognize as a thing that you might want to do. So like the seam allowance tools have little sewing machines. The different shape builder tools look like the shapes they're building. Okay, what do you think these tools are, even if I don't hover? Looks like it might have to do with angles or rotating. Okay, so um, again, I think they've done a pretty good job of having their icons look like what they're supposed to be looking like. Um, but again, hovering will tell you, and if you're still not sure, there's lots of different rotate tools, not just one. If you're not sure which of the rotate tools you should be using, look up in your little um, book here to see what the different variations of the rotate tools do. Um, now I mentioned that all of these tools have built-in videos or built-in help. I'm going to show you how to find them because you're going to want them. Okay? So up here near the top, there's something called video help. 
And if I click on, so it's a little arrow with maybe a little rainbow next to it and a play button maybe, right in the middle top of the screen. Now don't do it because I don't want to hear a lot of videos going. I'll do one up here so we can see. If I click on video help, do you see there's a little question mark next to my cursor? See that little question mark? If I click on something now, the video for that thing will pop rectangle, up. Click the make rectangle tool and type in your horizontal dimensions and vertical dimensions. This is our friend. We're going to get to know him. You can also quickly name your piece from the drop down list in the name field. When your piece is created, it will be added to the piece bar. Okay, so let's watch that again if you're not sure. Click on it because I was talking over him. To make a rectangle, click the Make Rectangle tool and type in your horizontal dimensions and vertical dimensions in the X and Y fields. You can also quickly name your piece from the drop down list in the name field. When your piece is created, it will be added to the piece bar. Okay, so he just mentioned this thing over here on the left is called the piece bar. Every time you build a piece for a style, it will show up in the bar over on the left. So that way, um, if you're zoomed in really far and there's pieces all over, um, you can quickly grab the piece you want. You can also put the piece away. So think of it as, here's my workspace on the table. This piece bar is like your pattern hook. So you can put stuff away within your file if you're saving it for later. Maybe you're done with all your lining pieces and you're working on your collar. You can have it put away, but it's accessible over here in the piece bar, and whatever you're working on is the active piece. Okay. So if we were to make this tote bag, or any tote bag, we would start with a rectangle, right? So how would I do that? What did he say to do? Click on the rectangle. Click on the rectangle. This little dialog box pops up. Okay, so maybe I'd want to call this uh, tote bag self or front or lining or whatever. You're not going to be turning this one in. This is just for you to fiddle around with the tool, so it doesn't matter what you call it. So you could name the piece, or like he said, if this is a program that you used a lot, I, I suspect when you hit the drag down, there may or may not be anything in here. When you click on the drag down next to name, what do you get? Nothing. Okay. I have a lot of things in here because these are all examples of names I've used in my, my file. Okay. So when, if you're using your computer at home, it's going to start remembering the things that you commonly call stuff. So um, this helps with consistency, I think. Um, <coughs> are you going to always call things front skirt or skirt front? You know, this way within a piece, you're not like contextualizing labels backwards. You can be kind of consistent. Are you going to capitalize everything or not? That's up to you. I just think a neat pattern set is consistent with the way things are labeled. And I think having it um, remember the last few things you've done helps you with consistency. So for this, we're not even saving this file. Name it whatever you want. I don't care. Okay. Now, <coughs> in um, the 1A class, how big was that rectangle? Let's see if we can do it from memory. Yeah, 36 what? 18. 18 inches tall, so my tote bag was 18 inches tall, and it was 36 inches wide because we just had one side seam. This is like back when we were still scared about turning on the sewing machine. We kept the actual sewing to a minimum. We made a, took a wide rectangle, sewed it into a tube, and then did the bottom, basically. Does that sound familiar? Okay. So, X and Y. So we know our dimensions are 36 and 18. But what direction? What should it be? Where's our grain line on this bag? And why? The grain line is this direction. Why? For the print of the fabric. Print of the fabric? Why else? If I put something heavy in here, I want it to be stronger in this direction, right? So my grain line wants to be going vertically to help with the strength. I don't want to put this on the bias because my bag will stretch, right? I want the strongest direction to be the thing that's carrying my textbooks, okay? So if I want the grain line to be going from the top of the 18 inches to the bottom of the 18 inches, that means the 36 inch all the way around needs to be on the cross grain. What should I type in this field? X is going to be 18. Why? Why? How come? 
Why is x going to be 18? The way it's oriented on the screen. The way it's oriented on the screen. This is the top. This is the bottom. This is, let's say, the right. And this might be the left. So we need to think about orientation is going the other way. Is everybody clear on that? So x would be 18. y would be 36. OK. OK, so this is now the top of my bag. This is now the bottom of my bag. And this and this would be my side seam. Right? Make sense? If I wanted to make a pocket, I would just need to know how big of a pocket. I could grab my rectangle, and I could call it pocket. Oops, not the right size. What should I do? Do you think undo might work? Undo works. Okay, we, we can undo. It's the same key command. Does everybody remember undo in life? Excel, Word, Illustrator, Photo. Oh, undo is always the same command. What is it? Control Z. Okay, or if you're on a Mac, it's Command Z. Okay, so that's the one command I absolutely need you to have memorized in your life in all computer classes. Okay, so if you mess up, either hit delete or undo. Okay, but if I really want this pocket to be a more reasonable size, I would think, okay, maybe I want the pocket to be six inches tall and five inches wide or whatever I want it to be. Just be remembering tall is X, width is Y, which is going to seem a little bit backwards. Okay, <coughs> so here could be my little pocket. Okay, and I could do some markings on the bag to show pocket placement. We'll be talking about how to do markings later. We'll be talking about how to add seam allowance next week. But once I've got my, my, my bag, now this is a little bit different. When we drafted it in 1A, we actually included seam allowance. I told you some measurements knowing that the seam allowance was included. In this case, when we're building it, you're going to be building it without seam allowance. We're going to be drafting like the sloper of the thing. And once we're happy with the shapes, then we would add seam and hem allowance. Okay? <coughs> Did I lose anybody? No? Okay. You've just made a tote bag pattern. Okay, minus seam allowance and all that other stuff. But this, that's basically it. So we're going to be taking, not basically it, we're going to be starting off with shapes. Most often the shape we're going to start off with is a rectangle. And um, like the, the pattern making book, she always starts off, build a rectangle this size, and then measure from this corner up or over to start plotting points. Once you know where your points are, um, remember how I told you I can draft patterns in Illustrator? How do I do that? Let's say I want to add a hip curve on in Illustrator. What would I do? I told you my little dirty secret. I scanned in a uh, hip curve and French curve. They actually have scanned in hip curve and French curve. I thought I was being so clever, but they already have that in here. <laughs> And it's part of a file that, that comes with your program. And what we'll do when it's time to start using those tools, um, we'll just load your French curve and your hip curve into here. And then it, it's actually a piece. And you bring it and you copy whatever you like from that curve and you paste it in. And so instead of tracing along the edge, we're just going to be copying edges. Okay. <coughs> the other thing before we really get going on the skirt is... I don't think they show it in here. Selection. Selection is um, a little bit tricky to wrap your head around in an Illustrator, which is saying something because you guys had a tough time learning how to select an Illustrator. Um, if I wanted to select a portion of a piece in Illustrator, how would I select a portion of a piece? And if you don't know Illustrator, ignore me right now. <laughs> Okay, but this is to try to get my, my Illustrator people to wrap their head around something a different way. How would I select just the hip curve? Like I said, I want to copy a hip curve from a hip curve. How would, how would I select just the hip curve? The Y arrow. Okay, so again, Illustrator people, watch those who aren't, just ignore this. Okay, if I wanted to select just this area, I could just click on that portion of the line or drag over that portion of the line. Okay. If I wanted to select more, I could click on one point, I could hold shift and click on another point, hold shift, click on another point, and I could get more of a selection. I can click those points in any order I want. 
I can click um, counterclockwise, clockwise, I can skip a point, I can add it later. Okay, it's very free form in Illustrator how you select. Yeah, you got to use the correct arrow, but you can select any direction you want, and um, that's hopefully now comfortable to those of you who are intermediate advanced Illustrator users. In Tuca, however, you can only select clockwise. That is all clockwise. <laughs> so if I use this selection tool, which is the tool on the left, which is an arrow. There is only one selection tool for line segments. If I want to use this, I have to select clockwise. So if I want to select one of these line segments because I want to copy it or change it or stretch it or whatever else I want to do, I need to click on one and click, it's been a while, click and drag from one to the next. And you see this line segment is selected. You seeing that? So I clicked on one of these points, I dragged to another point to let go, and my selected line is hot pink. Okay, Your selected line might be a different color depending on how the preferences are set up on your computer screen, but your selection is going to show up highlighted in another color. So can we all agree that that side seam on my bag is currently selected? Okay. Now let's say I select from this point, instead of going clockwise around the pattern piece, everybody familiar with clockwise direction? Okay. If I select that point first, click and drag to that point, I want you to see what gets selected. Remember my selection color is hot pink? What's happening? It's selecting the whole thing. It's saying, okay, I'm going clockwise and I'm going to select around. Okay. So that's the next frustrating part. First frustrating thing, which you're just going to have to get used to, is up is to the right. Second frustrating thing is you have to select clockwise. So if I wanted to select the top edge of the bag, my points are numbered here and we'll talk about how to turn on numbers or not. Um, if I want to select the top of the bag, what point do I click on first and what click do, point do I click on second? Top of the bag. First of all, where is top? Three to, four, like three, to four. three to four. Okay, so this is the top of my bag, and in order to select it, here's clockwise. So I would need to click and drag and let go of the drag at four. Oops. Okay, so a couple frustrating things to remember. Only clockwise, and, and I guess clockwise is that way for you. <laughs> Only clockwise and top is to the right. So far we have that memorized? Yeah? Okay. So I want you to close this file because we're not going to save it. It's going to ask you, do you want to save changes? No. You can either close it or you can undo to delete. I just think this is going to be fastest to close and we're going to reopen it. Okay. And this next one, we're going to um, build our skirt. Before we build our skirt, what do we need to know? Who knows where the skirt is in your textbook? Who has your textbook? Is everybody sitting next to somebody who has a textbook today? If you're not, make a friend. What page is your skirt draft on? I don't want to start off watching the video yet because we, we have to ignore his measurements. So we got to get our own measurements. We got to wrap our head around it before we move on. Everybody find it? 48. Okay. So this skirt draft um, starts on page 48 and it's finished on page 50. <coughs> it's a short exercise. It's going to feel a little bit longer because we got to get to know the workspace. But she starts off with a rectangle. If you look on the figure on the bottom right hand side of 48, she's got a rectangle with a vertical line running through it labeled AB and a horizontal line running through it labeled E through I. What is that AB line? If we look at the figure on the bottom of page 48, what is that? And if you're in an older version of the book, just dig around and find it. <laughs> Okay, so AB 
will be the X line. It will be along the X orientation. But what is that in the pattern? Is that front? Is that side? Is that back? What is that? That's our side seam. Okay. So we need to know the length of the skirt. We need to know the width of the skirt. And we're going to be building the front block and the back block at the same time. Okay, so we're not necessarily going to follow what she does in order. When we drafted this manually, we started drawing that vertical line and then we drew a horizontal line. We start with a cross first and then draw the rectangle. We're going to kind of go backwards. We need to start with a closed shape. So we're going to start with the rectangle and then we're going to draw the internal lines afterwards. Okay, and then we'll add in darts and adding curves and things like that. So we kind of need to figure out how big this rectangle is going to be. What, what's your proposition? How big should it be? Yeah. Yep, the length of the skirt will be the X direction sideways, right? So our length will run, so our A would be over here and our B would be over here. We're actually going to turn it just so we can not burn our brains out today, okay? But the length of the skirt should be what? What should we make our length? What makes sense? 22. We, we usually do 22 and a half in here. Why? I have a reason for that. You can make it any length you want, but I have a reason for 22 and a half. What is that reason? Maybe check your measurement chart. Do you see anything on here that's 22 and a half inches long? Waist to knee. Waist to knee. Why would it be helpful to have a sloper that's knee length? Yeah, I can kind of in my mind think, oh, I want that skirt to be three inches above the knee or two inches below. It's a nice reference point um, in actual flat pattern land. It's comfortable size to carry around. So I usually just make my slopers knee length. It, it makes it easier for me. If it's a pant, I make my slopers ankle length. So I, I can then chop them higher or lower um, as needed. But she doesn't give you in the um, on page 48, she doesn't give you a length. She just says skirt as desired. The real draft is everything above the hip. Everything below the hip's a rectangle, so it's very adjustable. So we're going to make ours knee length. So what does that tell us? X is going to be what when we make our rectangle? Let's make a rectangle, and we'll have that part done before lunch. What should we call this rectangle? Skirt draft. Sure, we can't call it front or back yet because it's both, right? Skirt draft. So we've decided X is what? 22.5. Okay, so that's our size 8 standard knee length for that lady who's 5 foot 5. So petites would be smaller and whatnot. But our, our basic fit model, she's counting on her being 5'5, five, 5.5. Five, five <coughs> what should Y be? Sherry mentioned it should be the front hip plus the back hip. 19.125. Is everybody in agreement? Do we need to include anything else? Oh, yeah, we got to include skis. So we're making right now, we're making a pattern for a woven skirt. So we want to make sure that she can eat and sit and walk and breathe. We don't want to use her measurements as is. We want to make sure we build in enough room that she can function as a human being. Okay? So if we look at our chart here, what, um, so these are labeled with line item numbers on here. What line item is our hip? Okay, so that hip is her full hip circumference. Agreed? Okay. <coughs> are we making her full skirt here? No, we're making the right side of her body because we're making a symmetrical skirt. What um, the computer will do is it'll quickly give, make you the other side if you want it. And you can decide whether you want the other side to be a fold or a separate piece. So we're going to be building this draft for half of the skirt. And the, the way the book is set up, the directions are for her right side, the, the right side that she would be wearing it on. Okay. So we don't want number four. What do we want? What else could help us on this chart? Hip arc. hip arc. Okay. So the hip arc is the distance between center front and side seam or center back and side seam. So we have a front measurement and we have a back measurement. How big, and let me write some of these down. 
Okay, so front hip arc, how big is that? Nine. Okay, so our front hip arc is nine inches. Our back hip arc is nine and one eighth. And everybody clear on where I found those measurements on a dress form? So those are at the widest part of her body, at her hips. Nine, and the nine inches is from center front to side seam. And the nine and an eighth is from center back to side seam. Now if I doubled this and doubled this and added them together, I should have the full circumference of her skirt. Okay. Now this is skin tight. So for our basic block, our book instructs us that we need to add an additional half inch for ease. That's going to allow her to sit and move. Okay, so in total, if I'm adding a half of an inch ease here, and if I add a half of an inch ease here, how much in total am I adding all the way around the skirt? Two inches. Two inches. So I'm adding half inch to the right front, a half inch to the left front, half inch to the right back, a half inch to the left back, and that would be adding a total of two inches all the way around. So her hip, her skin tight hip is 36 and a quarter. The skirt we're going to be making ultimately will be 38 and a quarter. It's going to have some extra room in there for movement and comfort. Okay. So what does this mean? Let's do some math. Those of you who are scared of math, what can you do instead of doing it in your head? Calculator. calculator. There is nothing wrong with using a calculator. So our front hip arc is going to be nine and a half. Our back hip arc is going to be, what's that math? Nine, five, nine and five eighths. What's nine and five eighths in decimal land? You're going to get really good at decimals. 0.625. 0 .625. So one eighth is 0.125. Um, I, I'm going to suggest you have a little cheat sheet, maybe sit there with your calculator one day and maybe on, an, on one of these papers on the back, flip it and go, one eighth equals this, one fourth equals this, three eighths equals this. Give yourself a little cheat sheet, okay? I think that's handy. Um, when I was a designer, I actually had a little cheat sheet taped to my desk because I was constantly having to convert to decimals and I didn't want to have to pull out my calculator or open up the calculator app every single time I wanted to use it. And at some point, they became ingrained and memorized, okay? So <coughs> I'm going to encourage you to find whatever helpful thing you need to make life easier for you. So 9.625. What's nine and a half in decimal land? 9.5. Okay. Now there are ways you can actually type in fractions um, in Tuca. It doesn't always work in all fields, so I think it's a good idea to start working in decimals anyway. Okay. Um, so, how wide should our rectangle be? So we know x needs to be 22 and a half inches because that's knee length, right? What does y need to be? What would I add to what? Yeah. So 9.5 plus 9.625 equals what? Who's got a calculator out? Hear whispers. 19.125. Okay? So is everybody in agreement that our rectangle needs to be, let me change this to 22.5. Okay? So that's going to be half of her skirt, her the right side that she's going to be wearing, and this is going to be knee length. So far so good. Have I lost anybody? Okay. Before we leave for lunch, I want you to have a rectangle that is now. 19.125 by 22 and a half. And I'm going to say, okay. Okay? Where is the top? Over here. Here's the hem. What's this? Let's orient ourselves. What's this? Center back. What's this? 
center front. When we get back from lunch, we're going to draw in where the side seam would be. We're going to draw in where the hip level would be. Okay, so some of you, this is very fresh in your minds. Some of you, this is not very fresh in your minds. I'm going to suggest before we meet again at 1 o'clock, skim pages 48, 49, 50. Don't memorize pages 48, 49, 50. They're in front of you. Skim it. I want you to have it in your head kind of where we're headed before we watch the video of how he does it because to do it digitally we have to kind of do some steps out of order just like we made the rectangle before we're doing the cross lines. So kind of get get your head wrapped around what you think the sizes and locations of things might be so that when we watch the video we can be like okay we're going to listen to him for this and then we're going to ignore that and then we're going to listen to him for this and we're going to use this measurement instead okay so uh let's do five after one meet back here we will um watch watch how to do it and then we're going to make our own any questions no? Um, if anybody else needs prereq uh, forms, Ellen is going to lead a tour down to the dean's office to get prereq forms. Yay, Ellen. Thank you. Um, for those of you who are new here and you want to eat here, uh, there's white tables out there. Oh, this is big for returning students. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. No, okay. It's not funny at all. No, this was nasty. Holly and I, and I'm still recording this because the people listening need to hear this too. Holly and I came on Friday literally to get copies made. Okay? I walked by the fridge. She walked by and was like, what's that smell? I was like, I don't know. I opened the fridge and literally almost threw up. I had to run out of the room and get fresh air. Open the doors. Open all the doors. It was like dead human and rat and sewer and all of it. The smell was horrific. Plus, there were roaches. And ants. In the fridge. And frozen into the block of craziness in the freezer. So we have removed it because people abused the privilege. The um, coffee maker was also green, fuzzy, moldy. And while I'm sure it still worked, I couldn't imagine drinking another cup of coffee out of that, no matter, we didn't have bleach here, but even if I had bleached it, so I threw the coffee maker out as well. Yeah. So, yeah. And the microwave that's there doesn't work because they haven't hooked up the power, so I didn't really clean it. Um, but the other one was gross, so we removed that too because we don't have a really clean of that. So, yeah, sorry, but I don't clean like that at home because I don't let my home get that way. Um, and I, whoever was in the textile class this summer kind of, oh well, they just didn't, the, the fridge was full. So, you can do what I do. Me too. <laughs> Frozen ice pack, insulated thing. I think there's um, microwaves in the cafeteria, I think. So, sorry, but you're welcome to eat here as long as you throw your That's the food. That's you have to clean all the food off the counters, too. People love food and, drink. and coffee mugs full of coffee or tea with roaches in it. So, like, I thought I had a cup of tea with a tea bag floating in it. Oh. And so I go to pour the tea out into the sink, which was black and disgusting anyway. We had to scrub that, too. And as I'm pouring it, I realize there's roaches. Not tea bag. Not tea bag floating out of the cup into the drain. I'm like, cool. Now I get to pick the roaches out of the drink. So if you happen to be one of the people that left Tupperware and or coffee mugs, um, it all got thrown away. And you wouldn't want it anyway. No. You wouldn't want it anyway. So sorry, but sorry. So don't leave anything here, please. Yeah, you're welcome to eat here, but at the end, the end of the day, down yeah. <laughs> sorry, but yeah, no, that was the worst thing I've ever had to do in my life. <laughs> the end. Go eat lunch on that high note. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>